uh, let's speak to one of those defectors, Kenny McCaskill. He was the SNP MP for East uh, Lothian, and he joins us now. Welcome to Spectator TV, Kenny McCaskill. Thank you. I was enjoying um, the discussion on Dundas. Uh, it was very interesting, I agree. He, the, the, the author also mentions the Hunterian Museum in, uh, at the University of Glasgow, which is one of the finest uh, university uh, museums uh, in the United Kingdom. It now has what's called a curator of discomfort. I'm not quite sure what that is, but it's got one. Uh, but I didn't get on to that. Anyway, back to you and uh, the, the elections. Why have you left a party which was led by the most popular politician in Scotland uh, to join one whose leader, Alex Salmond, is as unpopular in Scotland as Boris Johnson? Well, I think this is the... Uh necessary opportunity. It's necessary because the threat we are facing in terms of what happens post-pandemic, in terms of increased austerity, and there's the opportunity there by an independent supermajority. So fundamentally, it's about delivering an independent supermajority within the Scottish Parliament. But equally, it'd be fair to say that there had been issues within the SNP. So I depart in reasonable terms because I had many more good years and still agree with much. But there were issues that took me uh, to go. But fundamentally, Fundamentally, it's about what we can do. And I think what we can say is that we've already changed what was meant to be a rather sleepy election where independence was just simply going to be rhetorical. Uh, and it was a question of would the SNP get a majority and who would come second with independence now being front and centre of the debate? Uh, if you get this supermajority, you, you want a fast track referendum. Is that right? How, how quickly would you want a second referendum? No, what we're saying is it changes, first of all, the whole nature of the debate. Uh, I know the SNP position is they thought that Johnson would blink. We don't necessarily adhere to that. The, this uh, view that he'll change his position on the Section 30 orders that technology is. I think what we're seeking to do is to ensure that after the 6th of May, it's not a Scottish government asking a Westminster Prime Minister. It's in fact the Scottish Parliament representing Scottish democracy that is demanding the right for self-determination. That could be a referendum if they're prepared to accede to it. There are other ways it can be looked at in terms of court actions, international steps, and indeed just public uh, representation, whether in demonstrations as and when that's allowed. But Which, how uh, quickly, if you get this supermajority, how quickly would you like the referendum? Well, we want to move towards Scotland getting the necessary powers as soon as possible. Whether that's by way of a referendum, uh, that will have to be discussed because so far that's not an option being allowed. And therefore, well, What other this... way could Scotland get independence other than a referendum? Well, you can have negotiations between the parliaments. Ultimately, you're correct. Almost invariably, they have to be put to uh, the people in a, in a referendum. That happens. It's happened in Slovakia. It happened in Ireland over a century ago. But you can have the discussions about where you're going uh, rather than having a vote on the, 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 the concept initially. So there's a whole array of opportunities that we'd have to come about. But if the Scottish Parliament is representing the democratic will of the Scottish people, which is for independence, then I think that changes the whole dynamic, the same as Alba has changed the dynamic of the electoral debate. But the Scottish people on May are not electing a parliament for independence, they're electing a parliament to run their schools and their hospitals and their transport. Uh, That's a, if you look at opinion polling, a second referendum comes way down the list compared to hospitals and schools. The Scottish people have been denied a second referendum because Boris Johnson's made it clear that he's not prepared to do it. The Scottish National Party and indeed the Parliament have voted for a referendum and have supported that, and yet it's been rejected. In that circumstance, we see it as perfectly legitimate to use the Holyrood elections as uh, the means of giving our people a form of plebiscite. And that's why on the list vote, they can vote for ALBA, which is a vote for an independent supermajority. They're under no doubt what they're looking for, exactly the same as George Galloway is putting forward a party. So as I say, I think in the denial of democracy by a refusal of a Section 30 order, we've opened up the requirement to use the Holyrood elections as a plan B, as some of my colleagues used to talk about. But back in 2017, uh, just after the general election, and the SNP fought that general election on a second referendum, mm -hmm. uh, you wrote that there was, quote, no credible platform on which to win another referendum and that people were tired of referenda. 
that was only four years ago. What's changed? Well, I think one of the reasons I've gone to Alba is that there has been a lack of preparation amongst the leadership of the SNP. Action does have to be taken on discussing borders and discussing currency and discussing pensions, issues that we knew were difficult in 2014, issues that have now transformed because of Brexit. Uh, so uh, the groundwork has to be laid. Alba will be doing that and the Parliament can ensure that. <clears throat> so that was a position taken with regard to the SNP. And equally, it would also be fair to say that the Brexit uh, the Brexit deal that has been struck is causing mayhem in the economy in Scotland and my own constituency in particular the threats to our health and social services faced by trade deals that are coming down the line with the USA the attacks upon our parliament through the internal market bill, all of these things mean that the ground has changed and now is the time for Scotland to defend itself Alright, well four years ago that you wrote that doubts on the currency and on pensions, as two examples have not been answered or assuaged. So in four years, do you now have the answer? What currency would an independent Scotland use? Well, we're making it clear that we'll move towards our own currency. Initially, we have to use sterling. That is perfectly possible. Governor Mark Carney acknowledged that before he retired. Uh, there won't be a currency union. That was the position taken by uh, George Osborne, but there can be use of sterling. But we'll move as soon as we can towards a Scottish currency. That's uh, perfectly... Mm. So you would use a form of sterlingization, as it's called. You yes. wouldn't be part of monetary union, uh, but you would still use sterling, which you would have no right to print or to set interest rates, and you wouldn't have a central bank as a bank of last resort because it wouldn't be able to create money. How long would you be in that position? Well, I'd be for as short as period of uh, time as is possible. That's something that has to be discussed both within our party democracy and fundamentally by those negotiating. But I think, you know, there were there was a plan put forward by the Scottish National Party through the Growth Commission that was for some considerable period of time. That is unacceptable. It has to be in a reasonable time scale. It has to be quite speedy. But the precise term I don't think will be for me. It will be for those representing the Scottish Government and speaking on behalf of the Scottish Parliament. But it'll have to be speedier. And do you accept that if there was a new currency to be launched, that you would have to pay in your interest rates a risk premium because this would be a new currency with no track record for a country with a massive budget deficit and a balance of payments deficit? You'd have to pay a lot to borrow, wouldn't you? Well, uh, these these things have been changing and evolving. There are issues and challenges that we face exactly the same as those issues and challenges that the United Kingdom faces. But the resources Scotland faces, the position in which we are in terms of uh, being able to transition on to independence, we're in a better position than almost any country in the history uh, of being able to move out. So well, there are challenges, but the but you would move out with a fifteen. Destiny. You would move out with a deficit about 10% of GDP. It would be the highest deficit in Europe. You're proposing a new currency that you'd have to borrow in to finance some of that deficit. I doubt you could finance it all. So you would be paying a lot of money to borrow to get people to lend for that huge deficit. That's not a very good position to be in. Well, almost every government has been operating on a deficit other than Japan and China for many years. Uh, so it's nothing unusual. And indeed, as I say, I think the whole nature of the economy that we were told was impossible of deficit. You know, the whole coronavirus crisis across the world, not simply the Western world, has shown that uh, deficits are necessary, can be managed. It's how you deal with your economy. At the present moment, the Scottish economy is being damaged by the Brexit deal. You would be the biggest in Europe. What currency would people's pensions be paid in? Well, these these are things are arrangements that are made. They happen, you know, across borders. You're speaking to me from out with, you know, the United Kingdom. So it's something unusual uh, for people to be receiving pensions, payments, or whatever else in different countries and different currencies. But these no, are matters that have to be arranged. In, my pensions paid in sterling, which is what it. I always expected it to be. But what currency would an independent Scotland's pensions be in? Well, independent Scotland, once you moved into the Scottish currency, they would be in the Scottish currency. It would be depending where you're getting your pension. I will be receiving a pension, presumably from Westminster, unless arrangements are made with, uh, with the Scottish Parliament, and I'll also be receiving a pension through the Scottish Civil Service. Uh, so these things are dealt with by the individual institution, depending upon the... Well, you could, I would suggest if you have your own currency, you could only pay pensions in whatever that Scottish currency was, and there would always be a risk, which I think it would only be fair to make uh, uh, knowledgeable to the Scottish people, that as a new currency, 
uh, as the new kid on the block, there would be a risk that that currency could depreciate substantially against sterling, couldn't, wouldn't there? Well, there are risks in every currency, as we've seen with the, with the pound sterling, which uh, uh, has gone up and gone down or whatever. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day... Yeah, but that doesn't matter for pensions, uh, Kenya McCaskill. You know, it may go up or down, but you, you're paying for stuff in sterling and your pensions in sterling. You would be in a situation where you would be paying pensions in local currency. And against sterling, it could be substantially devalued. But the problem with the Scottish economy at the present moment is we don't have the levers of power. Our economy is underperforming. Uh, you know, I grew up in the 60s, a time when oil was discovered in Scotland and in Norway. Scotland has been left lagging way behind as Norway has motored on. The economy of the Republic of Ireland has motored beyond not simply Northern Ireland, but Scotland with a higher quality of life and standard of living. That's because these countries have been able to decide their own future, to take decisions, to benefit from their own natural assets. Assets. And so, yes, of course, you're correct. There are issues and challenges that we face, but equally there are opportunities because the tragedy for Scotland, Andrew, isn't how bad things are for the likes of me because life's quite good for me, I have to say, but tragically it's not good for so many more. Scotland should be doing so much better. We are underperforming. That's ultimately the responsibility of Westminster that has been in charge of the economic levers of power. Why are you so vituperative about Nicola Sturgeon? In July 2020, you described her as a narcissistic sociopath. Uh, no, I didn't. In July 20, uh, 2020, you were criticized for liking, you were liking a tweet. Oh, sorry, I corrected, but you liked a tweet calling her a narcissistic sociopath. Well, that was a, uh, that was a friend who had put the tweet out. It wasn't my words, and I was simply, uh, 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 it was in relationship to the, the person I knew. Uh, oh, no. I, so so you, sure you like things you don't like? Well, I think we all retweet things, and, you know, uh, social media has a downside. I'm currently getting a lot of uh, traffic in, as you can imagine, uh, and we come with that. I've stood shoulder to shoulder with Nicola Sturgeon and with Alex Salmon. I stood on the platform with them together on referendum. I disagree with actions that Nicola has taken, but equally I respect the contributions she has made when I served in cabinet with her and indeed her continued contribution in the Scottish Government. But we disagree on various issues and on that basis I have gone into the ALBA party. You accused her of treating voters with contempt. I don't know the context that you're you're referring to that. I mean, I may have I may have used those words, but I think you would have to tell me just what what the context of the article was because it'll be one reference to something. Right. Well, you, but it was a reference to a, a number of things that she had been doing. You accused her of, of the SNP had become under her a Stalinist, uh, strict Presbyterian sect. Well, I, mean, I think there are issues, and that's why I've chosen it's to the vituperation know. of the language. I mean, political disagreement, I can understand, but this is a uh, woman who has become, you know, the best known politician in Scotland, the most formidable politician in Scotland, uh, who leads a government that is almost certainly to be re elected in May in some form. And yet, your language about her is it's almost as if you were. Uh, talking in your language about the Tories. Well, I think if you will recall that uh, I was out of politics for a while. I was a columnist, as you yourself are and as your colleagues are in Spectator. You use language that you wouldn't necessarily perhaps use when you're an elected politician uh, to describe things. I, as I say, have the highest respect for Nicola Sturgeon. I disagree with her on how she has been running the operation of the Scottish National Party. It's simply unacceptable that her husband is the chief executive. I've argued that even you know when I was still a, a, an MSP. Uh, I think there are issues in where they've gone and women's rights that I fundamentally disagree with and I've written about in the paper today because I think uh, there are issues, whether it's in unisex toilets or the safety and security of staff and women prisoners in the women's prison estate, that the SNP has made big mistakes on. Uh, but I recognise her commitment to independence, I recognise her contribution, and that's why both Alex Sam and myself and every member of ALBA will be happy to stand shoulder to shoulder with her and every other member of the SNP on the wider common cause. If there is not a majority of MSPs after the election who, who stood on an independence manifesto, if there's not a majority what then happens to a second referendum? 
Well, it's exactly the same. There is a majority. Uh, it depends upon at uh, the present moment until the SNP are prepared to change their position, then we're dependent upon uh, Boris Johnson's uh, veto. We think that uh, delivering an independence majority changes the whole dynamic of the debate and opens up... Op- that, I understand that, and that's the, always the raison d'etre of Alba. I understand that. But if there isn't a majority of MSPs for independence... After May, what happens to a second referendum? Well, uh, I believe that there will be, but uh, the but position the position of Alba, and indeed the position I always subscribe to in the SNP, Andrew, was that I want independence, but also, as well as independence, I want Scotland to be the best it can be. So whilst you're in devolution, then you have to make sure that the Scotland that you seek uh, is as good as it can be. And indeed, if the people of Scotland were ever to decide that they ultimately didn't want independence, then it would still be my obligation in my home, to, home country to make sure that this is the best country that it can be. There are issues, you know, that we have to address in Scotland, not all of which I fully accept can be laid at the bear of London. We have to up our game across a whole swathe of areas. But the only people who are going to do that, the only people who will prioritise that are the Scots and the, through their elected representatives. The turnout at Scottish elections is not that impressive. If it was under 50%, if turnout was below 50% in May, where would that leave your mandate? Well, I I think the mandate would still exist because you take elections on terms of what is delivered and it's the outcome. Uh, There are challenges in this election, which is why, you know, postal ballots are increasingly being pushed. But even if half the Scots hadn't voted, that would surely undermine your mandate even if you were to win a supermajority. No, I, I'm not going you know, I'm not going to deny I want as big a turnout as possible and equally fair to say that uh, I think those in the more challenged areas where voting is perhaps less uh, the norm uh, are also more likely to vote for us so there's an imperative for us to actually try and ensure that and we will be doing that because I think what was clear was that in the independence referendum the turnout was higher in that referendum than it has been in any uh, Holyrood election before or after after. Uh, that tends to be the situation in referenda that do encourage huge turnouts and wider issues. So I think the turnout here will be sig- that substantial, will be significant because we've made this on the Constitution. Just a final question. Ian Blackford, who, who leads the SNP parliamentary delegation in Westminster in the House of Commons, he, he said of your defection that you'd become an increasing embarrassment to the SNP uh, and that your departure was somewhat of a relief. That, uh, as people who are united by a common cause, that doesn't sound like solidarity to me. Well, I think that's, uh, that's what Ian Blackford to comment on. He made similar curtic and caustic remarks against Joanna Cherry, who remains in the SNP. I think that's something Ian Blackford should reflect upon. I'm not going to criticise him on air. I've disagreed with him on issues, but equally, again, as with Nicola Sturgeon, on the cause of independence, I will continue to work with them as I always have in the past. Uh, and uh, I just hope that he will reflect and learn from that. Ken McCaskill, I know election campaigns are a busy time. So we're grateful uh, to you for giving us your time here on Spectator TV. Mm-hmm.